Breaking news from WRAL. Coverage you can count on. Breaking news. Police presence in Raleigh. Our breaking news tracker is on the scene. We're looking at chances for rain and a level one risk of storms. I'll show you the windy and chilly changes this cold front is bringing. Then should ballots from early voters who died before election day count? We go into the in-depth mailbag now at 7. All right, new in the last 10 minutes, a death investigation underway right now in Raleigh. Officers tell us a teenager has died. We begin with this breaking news tonight at 7 o'clock. Thanks for being here. I'm Ashley Rowe. And I'm Dan Haggerty. Officers initially got this call about a shooting a little earlier this evening. Right now, there are a lot of police officers right there on Spangler's Spring Way. WRL's Aaron Thomas joining us live from that scene. What have police or people nearby told you about what's happening there tonight, Aaron? Well, I can tell you, uh, Dan, based on this police presence, we've counted uh, nearly a dozen police cars on scene. A lot of the lights are so bright. We've had several neighbors that have come out of their homes just to see exactly what happened. And we're still on scene working to gather more information. But we can see them focusing much of their attention at this two-story home that's uh, covered by a lot of this police tape here. And I want to show you some video that we captured on scene to kind of go through the investigation process. So uh, we saw a police officer. It looks like he was scanning in one of the rooms. It looks like it's likely a bedroom and was also near one of the doors. Uh, we also saw what appeared to be a bullet hole on the siding of the home above the stoop. We also saw several uh, officers using flashlights and uh, searching the surrounding area where many of these homes are located. But obviously a lot of questions that we still have, such as what time did this happen? What is the condition? Uh, well, we know that the person's dead, but we also want to find out the, uh, what led to this shooting and we want to eventually find out their identity. Uh, of course, we'll have any new updates later in our newscast as well as online. Aaron Thomas, WRO News, live in Raleigh. Thanks, Aaron. Brian Schrader here in the WRO Live Center, where new at 7 o'clock, we are working to learn more about a death investigation in Cary. This is video from Sky 5 that we shot around 4.30 this afternoon on Smokemont Drive. Cary police say around 3 o'clock they got to that neighborhood with a report of a body found in that home. And you see that there is police tape up around that home. Cary police said that the public is not in danger. We're working to gather more details about this. Look for updates through the evening on the WRL News app and, of course, tonight at 10 and 11 here on WRL News. I know you'll be following it. Thank you. It's about to get a whole lot colder. Rain, even a chance of severe weather could be on the way. Meteorologist Kat Campbell is in the WRL Severe Weather Center with a closer look. Kat? This is a pretty potent system that we have coming our way. Right now, we already have some showers and storms in parts of Louisiana all the way up, and this is headed toward the Midwest. This gets here tomorrow night into Wednesday. So during the day tomorrow, it'll be cloudy, but overall it looks pretty dry. It's not until tomorrow night that we would see some showers moving in. This is 2 a.m. We've got some rain pushing through the area, and we'll see some of that rain continue through the Wednesday morning morning commute. We could see another band of some hit or miss showers and storms Wednesday afternoon. And although it doesn't look like much, those would be the showers and storms that could produce some damaging wind gusts. The reason why we're under a level one out of five risk for severe weather is for that threat for strong winds. But even if you don't see a thunderstorm with strong winds, everybody's going to see strong winds when it's not storming. I'll have a closer look at how high the winds could gust coming up. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Kat. Let's get to a couple of the big headlines today. Here are the five things you should know right now. Raleigh police are investigating an assault on Walnut Creek Trail over the weekend. Officers got a call just before 830 on Sunday morning along South Saunders Street. The woman says a man hit her in the face and then ran away. Officers are still looking for the suspects. The race for a seat on the state Supreme Court is razor tight. It's separated by just 66 votes. Democrat Allison Riggs leading Republican Jefferson Griffin. Griffin is suing the state elections officials right now, saying they're not giving him uh, public records on this as they want to see every vote is counted properly. But this afternoon, emails obtained by WRL shows his attorney canceled a request for a court hearing. Elections officials tell us that that's because they already provided all the requested records. The Canes announced a makeup date for the game, if you remember, the one that was postponed because of Hurricane Milton. They were supposed to play in Tampa on October 12th, but it was right after a deadly storm. It just wasn't the time to have that game. The teams will now play each other in Tampa 
on January 7th at 7 p.m. Clean water is flowing again in Asheville, more than 50 days since they lost it in the storm. The city lifted its boil water advisory today. Test results showed the water now free of E. coli and other contamination. President Joe Biden is asking Congress for nearly $100 billion in emergency disaster relief. This is all for Hurricane Helene and Hurricane Milton relief. Most of the money, about $40 billion of it, would go to the disaster relief fund at FEMA. As lawmakers push for more federal money for the two most recent disasters, North Carolina is still figuring out its problems with disasters from years ago. Today, the woman in charge of Rebuild NC once again faced questions from lawmakers. Laura Hogshead was asked about why more than 1,000 homeowners are still not back home years after Hurricane Matthew and Florence. This is at least the fourth hearing over the last year and a half where lawmakers questioned her leadership and progress. Chairman Brendan Jones asked her to resign. Is it your fault where we are with the numbers? Yes, sir. This is my Will you turn in your resignation today, please? That is, the, that is for the governor and for DPS. I'm asking sir. you, as this committee, having met with you several times, and I am frustrated, you can tell, will you turn in your resignation today if you're admitting your fault? No, sir, I will not resign. Okay. Hogshead also told lawmakers the agency is out of money. They need at least $160 million to continue. So, so why is the same person who led the failed recovery efforts still in charge of the agency? WRAL investigative documentary reporter Kristen Severance produced a documentary about this on the, on the thousands of storm victims still waiting to go home. She explains how we got here. Aftermath introduced you to some of the thousands of hurricane victims left homeless after Hurricanes Matthew and Florence. Rebuild NC had nearly $800 million in taxpayer dollars to get low-income people without insurance back home. Delays, red tape, and mismanagement left people waiting years. Hundreds of them, like the Williams family, were stuck living in motels. I, I just cannot believe that I've been stuck here three years. The program has spent $75 million on temporary housing for applicants. I interviewed experts like J.R. Sanderson, who led South Carolina's successful rebuilding efforts. You ain't got nowhere to go but up. He rated North Carolina's action plan for Matthew in 2016 and F. A lot of these problems could have been solved after Hurricane Matthew in 2016 and not allowed to grow and grow and grow. Laura Hogshead, who has been in charge of Rebuild NC since late 2018, has taken responsibility for the program's failures. These are my policy decisions and that is on me. She said she was still the best person for the job in a sit-down interview in late 2023. This is on you and you said that and you believe that then why haven't you resigned? I don't think that interrupting the recovery to replace the senior leadership here is the right move for the applicants. Governor Cooper said this about his state's program. Are you proud of this program? Do, do you think it's been a success thus far? The overall, the, the combination of the state federal program has not been successful because it has been too slow and it needs to speed up. And while he's added other leaders to the agency, he never removed Hogshead. Rebuild went from a program low in 2022 of completing five homes a month to more than 60 homes a month in 2023. In 2024, Rebuild is building more than 100 homes a month. 1,400 people are still waiting for help. And now the program has a deficit of over $175 million. All unacceptable for applicants like Franklin and Roberta Jones. Making a hundred and some thousand dollars a year and people out here struggling. Today, Hogs had said once again she would not resign and would make changes to do a better job if the agency was put in charge of disaster recovery after Hurricane Helene in western North Carolina. Several lawmakers said that should not happen. I'm investigative documentary reporter Kristen Severance and that's how we got here. You can watch our entire aftermath, North Carolina hurricane victims left behind, and all of our documentaries right now on WRALDoc.com. Important topic, yes. So, so we came to work this Monday morning with an in-depth inbox full of your messages. You all had a lot to say about whether the ballots of deceased voters should be thrown out. 
you want to talk about it, so we'll keep the conversation going, shall we? Let's go in-depth into the mailbag after the break. Brian? Dan here at the WRAL Live Center, a traffic alert for Fayetteville. The police there have closed a part of Ramsey Street, the southbound lanes, right around Hillsborough Street. I've looked at some other sensor data indicating some pretty heavy delays there. We're working to find out exactly why they have closed that section of Ramsey Street. Also, we're following breaking news in East Raleigh right now. WRAL's Aaron Thomas is on the scene of that investigation in an East Raleigh neighborhood. If we get any developments during this newscast, we will let you know. Kind of digging this uh, Monday routine that we've got going here at 7 o'clock. We talk about the news. You send in your comments and questions. Then we have a bit of a conversation. And that conversation recently has been about deceased voters. It was popping off in the inbox uh, over the weekend. I appreciate everybody who wrote in. See, on Friday, we talked about ballots that came from voters who cast a ballot early or in mail-in ballots and then died before Election Day. Now, normally, elections officials will throw out these votes. But on Friday, the Wake County Board of Elections did something unique. They accepted three of them. In two cases, the children of those voters, they came in and they begged the board to accept their father's ballots. In that third case, it came from an 18-year-old cancer patient, a girl who voted early and then died the next day. A couple of board members said that despite the stories that they heard and how emotional they are pulling on the heartstrings, they still shouldn't break the rule. But in the end, all three votes were counted. Now, I'd argue that the board did the right thing. When I vote, I'm not just doing it for me. I'm thinking about, you know, society, my kids, the world that they will inherit. And I got lots of emails from folks saying they agree with me. Margaret wrote and said 100% of these votes should be counted. This was one of the last things these people did for their, benefit, for their beliefs, honor their choice. Candy said, this is just ridiculous. They voted. That's another dumb rule that needs to be thrown out. And Kelly said, I think their votes should be counted. They were alive and voted as required. Most of you seem to think this is kind of a no-brainer, right? But it really isn't, not even close. Mark wrote, what if I cast a vote and then am convicted of a felony shortly thereafter? Does my vote get disqualified? So we asked the Board of Elections about this and we're, we're waiting on a response. But, but since felons aren't allowed to vote in North Carolina, I think it's safe to assume in this unique hypothetical case, that vote would be tossed out. It would be disqualified. They weren't a felon when they filled out the ballot, but they became a felon before that vote was counted. Should, should we count it? Teresa asked, why were the other votes not counted? If they are similar situations, all should have been counted, not just the three with compelling stories. And that's a great point, Teresa. The county threw out the other 42 votes that came from people who voted early or by mail and then died before election day. Should exceptions only be made for those people who do have a good, compelling, sad story or a family member that comes in to fight for them at that meeting. That's one of the reasons that having a hard, fast rule can actually be helpful. You already know the answer, regardless of the story behind it. It may have sounded a bit insensitive to some people to hear it, but it's why that one of the Wake County election board members you see here argued that they follow the rule and disqualify the vote, that having a rule, something in writing, can make these types of decisions a lot easier. John appears to be on this side of the argument. He wrote, early voting is casting a ballot early. Voting day is November 5th. Just because you fill out a ballot doesn't mean you voted. If you're dead before that date, you never voted. Dead people do not vote. Angela spoke to the more, I think, deeper, more personal part of voting and said it this way. My opinion after my death doesn't matter. My opinion doesn't matter after death. Interesting. Doesn't seem true, though, does it? I mean, this entire country is built on the opinions of dead people. Let's go back further. The Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius, said death is inevitable, but we can choose, a li a, a, a life full, uh, we can choose to live fully, leaving a lasting legacy of wisdom and virtue impacting the world positively. He wrote that opinion about 1,800 years ago, and despite me stumbling through it, I like it. And you don't need some dramatic example from Marcus Aurelius to understand this. My grandfather died eight years ago. And when I'm faced with something difficult, I always think, what would my pop do here? What would he say? What would he think? Let's not take that part 
of voting for granted. The emotional part, the, the romantic part of it. Yes, when it comes to who won, it's technical, numbers and counting votes and that sort of thing. But the question of how they won is a lot deeper. It's a lot more personal. Yes, people vote for policy and party and that sort of thing, but they also vote when they're inspired, when they believe in something. And we live in a country where that feeling can inspire an 18-year-old with cancer living her last 48 hours on Earth to spend a little of that precious time filling out a ballot, being an American, caring about what she's leaving behind for the people she loved. That feels like something we should cherish. Angela ended her email that she sent by saying, try not to contaminate the conversation with your personal opinion next time. No. Angela, that's this part of the newscast. This is how we do the, the in-depth part of the 7 o'clock news. We talk about stuff. It's a conversation. I say my thoughts, you say yours. Kind of helps us to get to know each other, maybe fill in a few of our blind spots. We all have them. So let's keep the conversation going. Tell me what you want the news to cover. Send me an email, dan at wrl.com. What topics need us to do an in-depth segment? Let's think critically about the world around us. Let's have a conversation. Tell me what's on your mind, and we'll go in-depth. It really is such a fascinating topic, Dan. Let's get to the weather, and this weekend we've got a temperature drop, and we've also got some serious wind gusts to deal with for the Christmas parade. And that wind chill, it's going to create some issues, I think. I mean, it's just going to be not that bad temperature-wise. You add the wind to it, and the kids that are going to be out there for the marching bands and different things like that, it's going to be pretty chilly. Grab the gloves, especially if you're a trumpet player or something like that. You'll be glad that you have them with the wind. At least it feels cool for the Raleigh Christmas Parade. It kind of feels festive like the holidays. We're talking about a sustained wind 10 to 20 miles per hour. And it's not just going to be windy on Saturday for the Raleigh Christmas Parade. It's going to be windy for pretty much the entire second half of the week. And because wind isn't something that you're typically looking at on the forecast, you know, you look at the icon, the high, the low. I really want to stress that the wind is going to be an issue later this week. We go from 73 on Wednesday down to 56 for the high on Thursday. It's that blustery northwest wind that starts to push in some of the cooler air, and it's a stretch of some cooler air on the way. You've got two more days with highs in the 50s and then temperatures tank Thursday. Friday, just 53 for the high, really feeling more like winter at the end of the week. But by next week, we've got some 60s, and it does look like an early outlook could have us in the 60s for Thanksgiving. Let's talk about those winds Wednesday night. We start to see the winds picking up 30 to 40 mile an hour wind gusts possible. So if you have any kind of loose decor up on the outside of your house, make sure that you really strap that down. Thursday, Friday, winds gusting 25 to 35 miles per hour. And then Saturday, 30 to 35 mile an hour wind gusts. It's all due to this front that passes by. And then we're going to be wedged between low pressure and high pressure. And that's what creates a strong wind gust. The next system gets here Wednesday, and we've got some rain possible Tuesday night into Wednesday. Perhaps a few thunderstorms. There will be a level one out of five risk for severe weather. Damaging wind gusts, the concern there with any thunderstorms that develop. Just keep in mind, we're going to see strong wind gusts whether or not you see a thunderstorm. And it's going to stay windy, as I mentioned, behind this front. As for how much rain we could see, tenth of an inch or less. At this point, it doesn't look like much. 63 degrees out there right now. It's mostly cloudy. That's what led to such a gorgeous sunset tonight. I hope you're able to see it. 53 tomorrow morning at the bus stop as the kids head home. It'll be about 70, so make sure to send them to school in layers. Not windy yet tomorrow. The winds don't get here until Wednesday night. Tomorrow night, we're up to a 50% chance of rain, a 40% chance Wednesday, and then we've got the chilly, breezy weather all the way through Saturday. Low temperatures are going to be dipping back in the 30s, but the wind should prevent us from getting to freeze territory the way it looks now. Okay, thank you, Kat. Hey, one of the closest elections in North Carolina is separated by just seven votes, but they haven't lost sight of the bigger picture. What we can learn from them up next in your one last thing. Hey, one last thing. The closest election in North Carolina appears to be headed for a recount. The day after election night, we told you about this race for a spot on the Wilson County Board of Education. At the time, John Kyle was ahead of the incumbent, Henry Mercer, by just one single vote. 
Today, after counting the provisional ballots, Kyle is now ahead by seven votes. Not exactly a comfortable lead, so no longer the closest in the state, but one of the one of the closest, and it's well within the margin for a recount. Recounts in local races only happen if the difference between the candidates is 1% or less, and this race between Kyle and Mercer is a lot closer than that, separated by 0.15%. The Wilson Times reports that Mercer plans to ask for a recount. He had until 5 p.m. today to file for that. We contacted his office, but we haven't, we haven't heard back yet. Now, bear in mind, Mercer has been on the school board for 20 years. Kyle is a local business owner, a rookie in the political sphere. So if Kyle wins, the race would represent a generational shift. No matter who wins, though, the race will also show us how candidates and people can treat each other and respect still matters. When Mercer spoke to the Wilson Times, he said about the race results, whatever it is, it is. I will accept that. I'm proud of the 20 years that I've served. It's always been about the children. Kyle posted about the race last week, writing, I am currently speechless. Mercer has set the bar high, and I assure Mr. Mercer and our community that I will do everything in my power to reach it. For a race that is so hotly contested, these guys have really kept the temperature low. It's pretty impressive. Uh, check this out. Uh, one day, up, Kyle found that somebody had taken so down his and, and his opponent's There's campaign signs and threw them in a ditch. Kyle pulled them over, got out of the car, fixed them both. So what I do? That yeah. is a level of respect that you don't always see in today's politics. And boy, oh boy, is it ever refreshing. It's not it's nice. It's nice. Yeah. You know, we can be like this. You know that, right? Um, if this indeed does go to a recount, a result will come down no later than next Tuesday. But no matter who wins, no matter their politics, I think we can learn a little something from how these candidates behave themselves, even when the race came down to just a handful of votes. And I think that the majority of people are good like that. Yeah. You just see the worst sometimes. Thanks for making WRL your choice for local news. Good. Have a great night. Good to have you with us. watching WRAL News over the air channel 34 and Spectrum channel 1257.